Back in the colonies, the fall of 1778 brings old problems to the doorstep of General George Washington. His army again faces chronic shortages. Limited food, tattered clothing and dwindling supplies, all compounded by an additional problem, no pay. It is a strain that weighs heavily on Officer Joseph Hodgkins, a 35-year-old cobbler from Massachusetts who has dutifully served in the war since its outset. Hodgkins has not been paid in months, a reality that is pushing even the most dedicated soldiers to weigh their commitment to the war against the needs of their families. My dear, you say in your letter that you are afraid that I shall stay in the cause of liberty till I shall make myself a slave to it. I have too much reason to fear that will be the case. I hope to come home soon and see you. Wishing you good night. Your most kind and affectionate husband till death, Joseph Hodgkins. For women like Joseph's wife, Sarah, life outside of the war has brought its own set of difficulties. In addition to raising their children, Tending to the family business fills her days. And with the value of paper money dropping to three to four cents on the dollar, budgets are stretched and families are feeling the strain. The problems on the home front begin to have an impact in Washington's ranks. Many officers resign their commissions and return to civilian life to provide for their families. But as veterans of the fight for independence begin streaming out of the war, another group is finding their way in. Slaves. They come from Rhode Island, a state desperate to fill its recruitment quotas, and are joining the fight seeking something all Americans are after, freedom. Slaveholding is common across many of the colonies during the revolution, from the north to the south. And although the colony of Rhode Island was founded on principles of tolerance and equality, it has grown as a major port and market in the international slave trade. Now, Rhode Island's politicians see an untapped resource for filling their ranks. The Rhode Island Regiment comes from a region that was, for the North, one of the major slave-holding regions. If they'd been in the South, they'd have been called plantation. But these are the largest slave-holding estates in the entire North. In order to fulfill their quota commitment, they offer to send some of their slaves. Now, in return for fighting for the Continental Army, the slaves are offered freedom. The slaves are not the only ones tendered an offer. The Rhode Island government offers compensation to the slave owners for their property but it is still up to the individual slave to agree to the enlistment. Here is your choice. You can remain a slave, or you can support this new nation, and as a result of that support, this new nation and your master will recognize your freedom. Now, obviously, this is a very difficult situation because you can't be sure that you're gonna get freedom if you fight. But the one thing you can be sure of, if you don't fight, you're gonna remain a slave. Soon, one out of every four able-bodied slaves in Rhode Island enlists in what becomes known as the 1st Rhode Island Regiment. And although George Washington once stood in opposition to having black slaves serve in his army, the new recruits are a welcome boost to his manpower-starved force. One thing we should always remember, from the beginning of this country to the present, African Americans have had a certain faith in the American dream. And I'm not talking about two cars in every garage. I'm talking about the American dream of personal freedom and opportunity. That's something that America, in its rhetoric, handed out to the world from the very beginning as the reasons for its existence. I think many African American slaves took that seriously. Mm -hmm. 